Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. By the late Miocene period, the even-toed ungulates of the order Artiodactyla had become the most diverse and successful lineage of hoofed mammals. These animals had responded well to the spread of grassland and savanna ecosystems that started to proliferate during the early Miocene, with multiple groups radiating widely, including the giraffoids, cervids, and most notably the bovids. However, artiodactyls as a whole originated significantly earlier than this, with the oldest members of the crown group appearing during the early Eocene roughly 55 million years ago. In the hothouse world of this time, even toed ungulates were relatively marginal animals, being generally small and inconspicuous when compared to their perissodactyl cousins. Among the most basal true artiodactyls were the Dichobunids, a family of often tiny generalist herbivores and omnivores that ranged from rat to white-tailed deer-sized. With relatively elongated limbs, heavy tails and slender bodies, Dichobunids would have resembled modern chevrotains in appearance and were fast, agile runners, a trait unusual among early ungulates. These animals stood on four or five-toed feet, with each digit ending in a small hoof, while they possessed complete sets of teeth, unlike the reduced and more specialised dentition of later artiodactyls. Although many genera have been described, there is relatively little information on Dichobunids available online, with much of it hiding behind academic paywalls. By far the most famous and well-known genus was Diacodexis, a small and widespread animal that ranged across North America, Europe and Pakistan between 55 and 46 million years ago. About the size of a rabbit, albeit with a long tail, this little browsing herbivore would have lived a similar lifestyle to modern forest antelope, and utilised speed in order to escape from predators. All later artiodactyls would have evolved from ancestors similar to Diacodexis and relatives. Dichobunids as a group thrived from the early Eocene to the late Oligocene, dying out approximately 25 million years ago, probably as a response to the cooling and drying ecological trends of the time. They were closely related to a rather different family of early artiodactyls, and these being the larger and superficially pig-like Helohyids. With powerful jaws and crushing teeth, these animals would have been omnivores capable of feeding on a wide variety of foodstuffs. In this respect, they were somewhat similar to the later Entelodonts, and have in the past been viewed as close relatives of them, but this is no longer thought to be the case. Hello Hyads were the first truly large artiodactyls in a generally perissodactyl dominated world, with the Middle Eocene genus Heliosus being comparable to a modern large suid like the African giant forest hog. Another large form, Archaenodon, weighed up to 285 kilograms or about 600 pounds and possessed a massive skull equipped with a prominent sagittal crest and formidable canine teeth. With its omnivorous diet helping it to carve out a unique niche for its time, Hello Hyads native to North America and Asia until the end of the Eocene when the group died out. Another early lineage of artiodactyls are still around today, with these being the tylopods. Once widespread and successful from the Eocene to the late Miocene, the only modern members of this clade are the camelids, which includes both the camels, of course, and the llamas and wanakos of South America. During their heyday, however, the tylopods were incredibly diverse, with many different families known from the fossil record. The majority of these were endemic to North America, and developed very similar adaptations to the distantly related ruminants, with forms ranging from tiny, gazelle-like browsers to heavy-set, hippo-like animals with short trunks. The oldest tylopods first appear in the fossil record during the early Eocene, roughly 50 million years ago, with the most basal group possibly being the poorly understood homacodontids. These are another of those prehistoric animal families with very little information concerning them online, and I haven't been able to find any images of individual genera aside from reproductions of their jaw fossils. They seem to have been small and generalised herbivores, very similar to the Dichobunids, with some paleontologists formally classifying them as a subfamily of these animals. However, their placement remains somewhat uncertain due to the scrappy and partial nature of their fossil remains. A basal clade that can be assigned to Tylopoda with some confidence are the Anoplotheroids, which first appear roughly 48 million years ago. This lineage contains several families, including the Anoplotheroids themselves, which were endemic to Europe during the Eocene and Oligocene. 
They were mid-sized terrestrial herbivores, comparable to modern deer in terms of size, but possessed low slung bodies with long and thick tails, and would have been quite generalistic in terms of diet. They probably would have resembled modern Dweekers to an extent, and lived in closed tropical and subtropical forests. The genus Anoplotherium was among the prehistoric animals featured at Crystal Palace Park in London, alongside the more famous sculptures of Iguanodon and Megalosaurus. This animal appears to have been capable of standing on its hind legs in order to browse, supported by its long and muscular tail. Living alongside the Anoplotherids were a closely related and similarly endemic European family of tylopods, the Canotherids. These were small, rabbit-like herbivores with keen senses of smell and hearing, with limbs that suggest they were fast, agile runners. They first appeared during the late Eocene, and persisted in Europe until the Middle Miocene, and possibly died out due to competition from other artiodactyls arriving from Asia, as well as the gradual aridification of their home region during the later Miocene. Finally, a more distantly related group, the Xiphodontids, were also endemic to Europe during the Eocene. These would have more closely resembled modern camelids, albeit much smaller. For example, the genus Xiphodon would have looked like a llama, but was only the size of a small dog, being no taller than a man's knee. True camelids probably evolved from similar ancestors in North America at around the same time, and would go on to have a long and successful evolutionary history on that continent. However, that story will have to wait for a future video. For now, I'll be sticking with the last and most diverse of all tylopod lineages, with these being the so-called Oreodonts. Known more formally as the Mericododontoids, <laughs> what a mouthful, this clade was endemic to North America, and first appears in the fossil record about 35 million years ago during the late Eocene, possessing peaked molars, small sharp canines, and rather full dentition, Lacking the diastemas present in more derived artiodactyls, oreodonts would have looked quite strange to us today, especially when compared to modern hoofed mammals that we are familiar with. None were particularly cursorial animals, with quite robust builds and long heavy tails. These traits were particularly pronounced in the most basal members of the clade, such as the unusual genus Agriocurus. Native to Canada and the western United States during the late Eocene and Oligocene, this sheep-sized animal possessed adaptations that are highly unusual for an artiodactyl, including an elongated body, clawed feet, and limbs that display similar adaptations to those of felids. The skull was quite narrow, with a rounded muzzle and teeth adapted for a diet of soft vegetation, while the postcranial skeleton suggests good climbing and digging ability. In life, Agriocurus would have more closely resembled generalised carnivorans, such as civets or raccoons, albeit weighing up to 85 kilograms or 187 pounds, and gives us a nice idea of what stem artiodactyls would have looked like. All more derived oreodonts appear to have been members of the diverse family Mericododontidae, one of the more basal of the many subfamilies within this lineage were the Leptokineids which were small, somewhat goat-like animals with proportionally large skulls with high-placed eyes and nostrils. Remains of these creatures are incredibly numerous in fossil sand dunes, indicating that they were desert specialists. Their teeth were high-crowned and adapted for chewing tough, gritty vegetation. The genus Cespia dwelt across the western United States during the late Oligocene and ranged from cat to goat-sized. With stubby proportions and rounded features, this animal would have been pretty adorable in life, looking like an oversized guinea pig. Another very plentiful animal, and the type genus of the entire clade, was Mericododon, a stocky, vaguely pig-like form that measured about 1.4 metres long. Given the shape of the limbs, it is unlikely that the animals would have been able to run fast. Unlike modern ruminants, they had a full set of teeth, although the molars were adapted for grinding up tough vegetation. Notably, they had strong and very striking canines, that were probably utilised for intraspecies combat. The number of fossils found implies that, at one time, these oreodonts were as plentiful in South Dakota as zebras are today on the Serengeti Plains. Meanwhile, the rare Oligocene genus Eporiodon was one of the largest oreodonts, with some specimens approaching the size of a domestic cow. With its prominent canines, heavy tail, and long torso, Eporiodon would not have resembled any modern ungulate, 
seeming more like a herbivorous carnivoran of some sort. Other oreodonts occupy different and more specialised ecological niches, with Promericorus being a one metre semi-aquatic hippo-like animal. Like most members of the clade, it was not a particularly large genus, especially when compared to its closest modern analogues, with Promericorus weighing between 30 and 60 kilograms. The similarly sized Brachycrus from the Middle Miocene possessed strongly retracted nasal openings, suggesting that it would have had a tapir-like proboscis utilised for grabbing vegetation while browsing. The Oridont as a whole thrived throughout the Oligocene and into the Mid-Miocene, when they were the most common ungulates in North America. Despite their lack of adaptations for running or feeding exclusively on grasses, these animals were creatures of most at home in savanna forests and areas with low-growing vegetation. However, oreodonts become gradually more and more scarce starting around 12 million years ago, and vanish altogether by the beginning of the Pliocene. Why this formerly successful lineage died out so suddenly is still not well understood, although their extinction does coincide with the disappearance of the North American rhinos, Teleocerus and Aphelops. All of these animals may have been unable to adapt to the rapid climatic cooling, increased seasonality and the expansion of C4 grasses that took place during the Pliocene. It may also not be coincidental that deer of the family Cervidae had begun to enter the continent from Eurasia for the first time roughly 5 million years ago, perhaps putting strain on the already declining oreodonts and later filling some of their niches. This would not be the end of the tylopods as a whole, however, with the camelids persisting and migrating into Eurasia and South America. But that is a story best left for another time. Thanks for watching, everyone. In the next video, I'll be covering the evolutionary history of kangaroos and their relatives. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.